Uh, wow, I'm actually quite impressed with the turnout. Uh, this is the end of the, you know, the last session on the last day of the conference. Uh, this is security, right? Not very popular. Uh, I'm not one of those revolutionaries saying like, you know, uh, uh, controversial topics or, or statements like I've heard some of the other speakers this week. Uh, I, um, I do training. Uh, I work in a lot of open source and I think about security quite a bit. So um, that's the point of this talk is to basically uh, list out, and unfortunately it's kind of a you know, list of this topic and this topic and this topic, of lots of um, security threats that we have uh, when building web applications. And so I think maybe a lot of these you guys may be familiar with. Um, some of the mitigations for some of these common attacks that we're going to see, uh, you may not have heard about before. And so that's kind of the idea here, is just to kind of open your eyes to these things that help you defend your applications when you're building them, okay? So that's the point. My name is Brock. You feel free to uh, contact me if you'd like. Uh, and basically, like I said, I just have a huge list of things to talk about. Um, so again, very much from sort of a training perspective. But again, hopefully this opens your eyes to some things out there that, that you may or may not have seen before. So we're going to talk a lot about SSL, uh, a lot of things around SSL. Uh, we'll move on uh, later on and talk about a bunch of injection-related attacks. Uh, and it's, that's kind of a general theme, but there are you know, specific types of injection attacks and different ways to, to help mitigate against them. And just a, a list of, of other uh, gotchas that you really need to be aware of when you're building your applications. Okay? So to start off, um, the first kind of threat that we are concerned with when you're building web applications is that of the network. Right? We're running on a public network, right? maybe browsers may need to make requests to web servers, or even web servers need to make requests to other web servers, right? doing web API calls, or maybe even web servers need to make calls to like a database server. Right? There are network hops involved. And so there are lots of threats when running on a uh, public network. The first one, of course, is if you are sending confidential data, right? you don't want anybody who is eavesdropping on that network to be able to intercept that data. Also related to that is maybe you're not sending confidential data, but you want to make sure that the data that's being sent isn't modified in transit. Okay, so that's also another big concern uh, on the network. Uh, and also just uh, related to network security, you want to make sure that whatever server that you're talking to across that network is actually the server that you think it is. Uh, think of uh, as a consumer. Right? You're using Amazon, and you're entering your credit card number into their website, and you're submitting this you know, sensitive piece of data. How do you even know that this credit card number is being sent over this network you know, through the interwebs and landing on a server that's actually you know, owned by a company called Amazon that you trust? Okay? So the whole network, right? you just have to be suspicious <laughs> of doing anything on the network, and you know, guarantee, or at least do the best you can with the technologies we have, that you are talking to the right server, that nobody can read your confidential data, and that it can't be modified in transit. Okay? So how do we protect against that when we're doing network calls? Well, the answer is easy, right? We use SSL, or TLS, or HTTPS, whichever name you want to, you want to use for it. And so the idea with HTTPS is that uh, we are leveraging this, and you know, a bunch of smart people have already figured out uh, how to achieve basically these three things that, that we just described as threats. The first and foremost thing that SSL gives us is it gives you server authentication. Okay? It doesn't give you encryption, right? That's always like what my mom thinks of, right? When she thinks, about, oh yeah, HTTPS, I see the lock, right? What it's really giving you is server authentication. Before you send any bits across the network to some other machine, you better make sure it's the machine you think it is. And so using SSL uh, is going to give you that first and foremost. Okay? Secondarily out of that, then we're going to get this concept of integrity checks on the bits that we are sending. And integrity checks are what guarantees that uh, the data is not modified in transit. And then the third one, which is again really the least important of the three, is that we also get the ability to protect the data, make it confidential, uh, using encryption. Okay? So, how many guys use SSL on all your apps? Even within the firewall? Eh, not as many hands up. I think it's just as important in the firewall 
as outside of the firewall, right? Bad guys, right, the medieval ages, right, they come in and they wouldn't try to run through the front door of the castle, right? They would try to find, you know, back doors in. And so I think even within the network, uh, you should do something to achieve this same level of network uh, sort of security. Uh, IPsec is another way to achieve these things as well. Um, but, you know, if you're not using that, then we have something like HTTPS, okay? So again, HTTPS, I think, is really important between every network hop, whether it be a browser to the web server, web server to another web server, or even to your, your database, okay? So, have you guys ever set up SSL? Right, a few people, okay? So I think that this is really important to do, um, even while you're doing development, okay? And so, um, well, actually, how do, we, how do we even get SSL? You need to get a certificate, right? And set this up in your web server. And that's help, what helps bootstrap that, that whole process. So uh, while you're doing, uh, you know, in a production public facing website, sure, you need to go get a certificate from one of those companies that, that charges, you know, way too much money. Uh, to sign and bought and go daddy and all those things. Uh, but even, uh, you know, even on your, your internal network, even for like development and QA testing and things like that, you know, you probably don't want to spend the money just for a test certificate, but you can still set up certificates uh, in your environment. And so what I want to introduce real quickly is show you uh, how I go about doing that. So, um, Again, I do a lot of open source development, and, and one of the uh, most common uh, configuration problems that people run into is just, you know, ah, SSL's not working properly, right? And the minute you introduce two machines, you know, it starts to, to baffle people how to actually establish this uh, secure connection. So obviously one quick and dirty way to do this is you can create a, some web application and just within a, a, your own machine, and I don't even need to do anything uh, interesting in my application here. Uh, I can just set up a little web page. Hopefully, at least this is So obviously, in, in uh, if you're using Visual Studio, uh, there's a little F4 button, right? Flip the little little checkbox here to say use SSL, uh, and then what will happen is the IIS Express version that you're using will then uh, be configured to do SSL, and then you grab whatever that URL is, uh, and in your property pages, at least this is what I do, uh, is I go and make sure that my project when I launch is simply going to that you know SSL URL. Okay, so that's fairly easy uh, on a single machine setting this up. Okay, great. Uh, now, of course, that certificate didn't come from VeriSign. It's a certificate that was configured as part of the Visual Studio install. Uh, but we are, you know, actually doing, you know, some SSL work here. Um, the other thing, though, is that if you want to start testing uh, against IIS, you actually need a, a proper certificate. Um, so if I were to take this directory, and let's just set this up real quick in IIS, a lot of times in IIS, to configure this, um, what we do is we set up a, a new website. Okay? And so the reason we set up a new website is uh, just a, for a, a partitioning reasons, but it's at the IIS, uh, at the site level that you configure the bindings, and the bindings are what configures the protocol level stuff, right, HTTP or HTTPS. So if I'm going to set up some uh, sort of website, uh, let's call it, uh, you know, uh, foo.bar, because I have a great imagination, right, I'll pop in that web application here, and you want to go and configure, well, we'll just do HTTP for the... Uh, um, for to get started here, okay? And so I probably can browse to that. Foo.bar. Oh, actually, I can't browse to that. Why not? Yeah, there's no DNS entry that knows to go there, okay? So a very common thing that we end up doing is we end up hacking, uh, if I can get Notepad running here, ha hacking the, uh, the host file on the local machine. So what I end up doing often is opening up Notepad as an admin, and you open up you know, drivers, Etsy, hosts, okay? And this is sort of a, your hacky little uh, way to set up, you know, the 127, and you can see this is my machine, I do this quite often, dot one, right? And whatever I wanted that to be, which was, I think, foo.bar, okay? So I'll just set that up, I hit save, and now if I hit refresh, look at that. I can now actually go to that site. Now I'm not going over SSL yet, but at least I have my DNS problem solved. So the next thing I want to do is set this up using SSL. So to do that, I need a certificate, okay? So again, if this were a public-facing website, you'd go through the, the standard procedure and go get one from VeriSign. But this is just my own local machine with a hacked up you know, DNS entry. 
So what we need is a certificate that goes along with this, you know, this, this website. And the big thing about the way certificates work is that when you create a certificate, inside of the certificate is the host name of the website that you're trying to go to. And that needs to line up for the SSL trust to be established. So I have on my local machine here, uh, under my good old bin directory, I have some script files okay, uh, that run a tool called MakeCert. Okay? Any of you guys ever run this one? Yeah, right, okay, so you guys probably seen this before. So this is, uh, you know, and God forbid, I, you know, for me being able to explain all these different parameters, like what the heck is 1361, I had to look this up, you know, at some point to figure out the right uh, parameters to pass. But this is going to basically generate for me a certificate whose name matches whatever uh, parameter I, I put in here. And part of the way I, I'm configuring MakeCert is this will set this up uh, in my local machine so that it's available for my IS. So if I can run a command prompt here as an admin, okay, uh, then I can run my little uh, uh, my tool here, cert SSL, um, and I need to give it foo.bar, which is the name uh, of my, my website, and that'll match um, the parameter here. Okay. So what this just did is uh, set up, actually I'll show you the long way of doing this. I can run MMC now, and on my local machine then, uh, I can look at the certificate store. And we can look at the machine-wide certificate store. This is where the Windows operating system manages these certificates or keeps them securely. And so I can run this guy. And now, looking on my local computer, I can look under this personal node up here in the little tree view. And this shows you all the certificates that you have uh, where you have the, uh, the private key for. Okay? So I just generated a certificate with a private key, and it got created right here called foo.bar. Okay? And so then what I can do over here in my application is, uh, in my website, okay, I can set up a binding. I can do SSL. Okay? I'm going to use foo.bar as the host name. Okay? Uh, and this is uh, using uh, this thing called SNI, server name indication. It's how you can have uh, multiple host names on the same server with different SSL certificates, <laughs> which is what we have here. Uh, and I pick my SSL cert, which is all kinds of test certs that you see here, but there's the one. Okay, so I should be able to hit OK here, okay, and now that certificate will be used for doing uh, SSL. So now if I go to HTTPS, okay, I go here, ooh, we get the dreaded dialog, okay. So obviously you could just, uh, I think, click this to continue, <coughs> but that's kind of a, uh, uh, that's kind of a, 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 you know, a fake trust to the website. Um, this works because I am a human and I, can, I know I'm testing it and I can click the button to say bypass this. But if you were doing this programmatically, let's say this were a server, a machine making programmatic web API calls to a, another server, right? you know, maybe these are split across two machines, then there's no human there to say, oh, I know it's not really trusted, but accept it anyway. So the last thing I need to do to really make this trust established is back over in my certificate store, you have some sections over here which are trusted certificates. These are basically um, how your machine is bootstrapped uh, at install time to automatically trust certificates from VeriSign and Thought and all these others. And so what I do is when I'm doing my testing, just for testing, not production, right, is what I can do is I can take this certificate uh, that I have the private key for and I can import the public key portion uh, into this trusted root certificate authorities teaching my computer to trust that certificate that was just generated, okay? Now there is a quick shortcut here, foo.bar, I can copy this guy uh, and paste this over. Um, there are some poten potentially some issues here with that, but uh, it looked like it uh, only copied over the public key part. Um, but anyway, if you have the, the public key part, um, let me actually show you how we generate that real quick, foo.bar. You can uh, export this guy, and when you export it, Right, you're not going to export the private key. And the intent with this is just to create a uh, foo.bar.cr. Uh, this is creating the uh, public key portion of the certificate. And you export this, and then you can take this to the other machine. And that would be the other machine that needs to trust this server using SSL. So on the client machine calling this guy, uh, you could import this certificate into this trusted root certificate authorities. Uh, I did a quick copy and paste, but you could uh, you know, do this import to go import it. <coughs> okay? 
Okay, and so that's a really uh, you know at least that's how I work by setting up uh, SSL across multiple machines uh, if I want to do you know proper SSL testing uh, in my application. Okay, so any questions just kind of about some of the, the high level steps that I just went through there? Okay, anybody else do this same same way? So a few people already know about that. That's great. Okay. So a lot of people, though, like I said, uh, when I do, uh, uh, you know, help on the, uh, we have a, the, uh, all our codes up on GitHub, and uh, again, a lot of questions come in just about, oh, you know, my web API, I can't call it over over my test certificate. Why, you know, I don't really understand. And it's basically you have to configure the trust and the SSL properly uh, across those two machines. Okay, at least if you're doing test certificates. Okay, so hopefully that was good. Uh, any questions about that? Before I move on. Okay. Uh, I really think there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing SSL for everything. Okay? So it's really, really important. All right. So um, that's basically the first thing that, that uh, I think uh, people need to be enabling and just using by default. And doing it during development helps you along that process so that you just are used to doing it all the time. Okay, next thing that uh, we sometimes see in web applications is uh, this, well, actually, this dial is definitely a, a bit older. I actually had, I think I had to, to run like a Windows 7 machine uh, to get this dialog screenshot. Uh, but have you guys ever seen this dialog before in any web pages? Yeah, it, we don't see it as much anymore, uh, but, but fundamentally what's happening is if you go to a website, a web page over SSL, okay, and then the content in that web page references a, a JavaScript file or an image or CSS, that's not over SSL, then that's a bit of a problem, right? If you think about it, right, the whole point of going over SSL to the website was to make sure I'm going to the right server, we can do server authentication, make sure it's the right server, you know, and then all the other benefits I said over SSL. But once that page is loaded, we have a certain amount of trust about it. If it then goes and does not use SSL to load JavaScript, then you're kind of back to square root one, right? You, you don't have any then further trust uh, uh, of the security of that page. And so that's what this dialog was, was meaning to alert the end user to. Okay? Unfortunately, by asking the user what it should do, it was really kind of doing the wrong thing. Okay? Because it says, uh, hey, it's secure and non-secure. What do you want to do? Do you want to continue, yes, or not load the, the JavaScript or whatever it is? No. Right? Which is the right answer? No. Yeah, neither one of them, really. <laughs> because if you hit yes, then you potentially can get compromised, right, by a man in the middle attack. If you hit no, then the page doesn't work, okay? And that just sort of stinks. So uh, what uh, what they, you know, I don't know, the, the the standards committee did is to solve this problem is they came up with this concept of protocol relative URLs. You ever seen this? So if you're referencing some some resource, what you do is you do slash slash at the beginning, and what that does is if the page was loaded over HTTPS, then that resource is loaded over HTTPS. And if you're just over plain HTTP, then they just use plain HTTP, okay? This is very much the recommendation a couple of years ago. It actually is starting to become an anti-pattern now, okay? Because that means you have to have that available over SSL, right? I mean, that was kind of the point. So if you have it over SSL, why don't you just always use SSL to get the benefits of server authentication and to verify that you're getting it from the right source, okay? So anyway, these have been around for a while. Uh, I mentioned them because you'll probably see them around, but if it's there over SSL, Probably should just use SSL. Sorry, bro. Yeah, go ahead. Just to say that uh, I've had this problem before as well, and everything was loaded by SSL, but there was a four which was forcing to run HTTPS. Yep. And, 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 and Chrome was complaining about it, and IE wasn't. Yeah, you're right. And, and so you might get differences in browser behavior of these things. Yeah. Chrome is strict. <laughs> yeah, Chrome is strict. Well, it probably should be because the user thinks that they're, you know, over a secure connection, securely sending <coughs> data, and the user doesn't know to look at the source code to verify it's really submitting over SSL. Maybe IE, I don't know, more relaxed about it, so. Okay. All right, so that's another, oh yeah, question. There was just another thing I wanted to mention with the, if we use HTTPS, it also will only cache one version of the file because caching browsers do it on a protocol basis. So when we use that, when we do switch to HTTPS, it will then possibly re try and get that file again. Sure. It's just a small as well just benefit to using HTTPS always. Oh, I, I thought the, the reason I thought you were starting the, the the comment was because you were actually saying we lost something by not caching, but it sounds like you're saying the opposite. 
like ha having HTTPS always means that we cache it, but only the secure version, not two versions. And so instead of calling the server twice, we're calling it only once. For you mean if I, if I browse later in the day yeah. or something? Yeah, if you for browse on HTTP, it'll get the file, cache it as a HTTP version of it. Okay. If you later switch on to checkout or a login page, yep. and it pulls it in the HTTPS, it will then do a new call sure. to get the HTTPS. Sure, sure. Which is an unnecessary call. You can just do it in HTTPS always. Well. Again, I would advocate you shouldn't be doing HTTP at all. Yeah. So always start with the, the, the right protocol. Okay, good. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, uh, is also an issue related to HTTPS is let's imagine you go and you use HTTPS, you go log into the website, and then that website issues a cookie. Okay? And that cookie is your login cookie, your session cookie. Okay? So there's a potential problem though, is that if you do transition to a non SSL page, <coughs> The browser has this cookie for this website. Well, what's it supposed to do with cookies? It's supposed to send them back to the website on every request. And so you got a cookie over a secure channel, right? And now it's great because then we have prevented eavesdropping, somebody from stealing it on the network. But then you happen to visit a different portion of the site. Uh, maybe it's the main website that just is the marketing part of your website or whatever. Your browser will send that cookie along. And that cookie represents your login to the application. We don't want that leaking on the network. Okay, so there's a feature in cookies. When you issue cookies, you can mark a flag saying secure true. And what this is doing is it's telling the browser, when the browser gets the cookie, that it should only be sending it over SSL. So if the, the user then visits a non-SSL portion of your website, then that cookie will not be sent, and you are protecting the user from having their, you know, their token, their cookie, for logging in uh, leaked onto the network. Okay? So, Probably most of the time you should be setting those, those security cookies. Okay, so this kind of gets back to the comment I said earlier. You know, hey, it would be really nice if we could just always go over SSL to the application, okay? Well, you can't really protect users from typing in the wrong you know, protocol into their browsers. So there's an interesting specification called HSTS, or HTTP Strict Transport uh, Security. And what this does is it's a way for your web server to teach the browser and tell the browser, hey, you know what? Whenever you come to my website or whenever you come to my URLs, always go over SSL. Okay? Even if the user types HTTP, the browser will say, hey, I've been taught or I've been told that for this website, we should always use SSL. Okay? So this is a header that you can emit from your website called Strict Transport Security. Okay? And you give it a max age, which just says, hey, remember, remember that I told you to go over HTTPS you know, for, that, for that duration. Okay? And so again, for that duration, uh, no matter how the user initiates the call, uh, it will be done uh, over uh, HTTPS. Uh, there's a little bit of a bootstrapping here, though. Of course, you had to have gone to the website first, uh, you know, for uh, the first time over HTTPS uh, for this thing to have issued it. Um, so, uh, again, common pro kind of problem is that uh, maybe your home page is, is, allows you know, just HTTP, you immediately redirect to the SSL portion of your site, and then you can emit this header so that then the browser, no matter you know, whenever they come next, uh, will be over SSL. Okay? All right, anyway, it's a nice thing, nice thing to add into your, to your websites. Anybody using this today? No? Okay. All right, well, good. Something new. Uh, obviously, there's a flag here includes subdomains, so that could include all the sub subdomains under whatever uh, domain you're coming from. Uh, also, then again, this uh, this behavior is now cached for that duration. Uh, if you want to disable the cache, uh, then you can emit max age of zero, which will basically tell the browser to okay, stop remembering to always come if you if you needed to to turn that off. Oh, oh, the other thing about this too is that so I said that there is this initial bootstrapping where you have to come the first time. And have your server emit the header, uh, you know, the header value, so that it will know no matter what to always use SSL in the future. Um, some browsers, I don't know if if, if uh, the IE and Edge browser uh, allows this, but Chrome definitely does. And actually, I, I forgot about Firefox as well. But Chrome, um, you can actually submit a bug to their. Um, oh well, let me take a step back. Browsers have a preloaded list of websites that they will always do this on. Okay, um, and so that kind of avoids that very first 
bootstrapping request to teach the browser to do this. Um, and so browsers have this, 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 you know, just it's just built baked into the to the compiled code is the list of, of websites to always do this for. Um, you can open up a bug with Chrome and basically get your website added to that list. Okay. So if you're running a you know big uh, you know big website where a lot of people are going to be visiting it, you can actually teach Chrome ahead of time to make sure it always comes over uh, SSL. Okay. So. Um, good. SSL is really important. Uh, we have some mechanisms for like teaching the browser to you know always use SSL. Um, what's the trust mechanism that we have established for SSL? Like why is SSL like the the the, the thing that we trust to, to get securely to a website? Well, it's pretty much driven on the fact that the certificate mechanism that we're getting from the website right proves that we're talking to the right site, you know, the right endpoint. But um, there is that bootstrapping process, um, which the certificate that they have for the website has to be trusted by us. Now, I don't download the certificate for every website I'm going to, right, and, and set them up ahead of time, right, kind of like I did manually for my test scenario, right? But what we have done is we have a list of sort of top level certificate authorities that we've trusted. So your website gets its certificate from the trusted authority, like VeriSign or whatever. Uh, so that's really kind of now the point of failure that attackers maybe start like going after, okay? And so if an attacker can somehow fool one of those uh, certificate authorities to issue a certificate to them, and then they can present that certificate, you know, maybe a man in the middle attack on the network, uh, maybe I'm, I'm on somebody's Wi-Fi and they're routing my DNS entries to the to, to their server and not the real server. And if they can present a certificate that looks like it's really from VeriSign, then they can pretend to be the website that I'm trying to go to. So in essence, the next sort of thing that attackers attack is these certificate authorities. Uh, and there have been some cases of this where this has actually happened, and I forget what country it was, uh, but there was some country in the Middle East that was um, where this was was detected, uh, and what was happening was uh, all the the users in that country they were basically using the you know the uh, country supplied DNS and network systems, and what they were doing is as the traffic was routing through that infrastructure, um, they were doing these man in the middle attacks, okay, and they had uh, fooled again I don't know what certificate authority, but there was some certificate authority in Europe that had uh, been fooled into thinking that this was Google who asked for a certificate. So what had happened was basically, um, you know, somebody who owns the infrastructure that you're making requests over, they can route the request through their servers, and when you think you're going to Google.com or Gmail or whatever, and they can present a certificate that looks like it's you know, really from Google because it came from the certificate authority that all the operating systems or all the browsers trust, then they basically man in the middle um, your, you know, uh, man in the middle uh, attacked the end user. And we've been using SSL and thinking it's perfectly legitimate and perfectly safe. Okay, so that's a pretty interesting attack. Of course, you have to be in control of a lot of things to make that attack work. Uh, so it turns out, though, that this is a, a sufficient enough of a threat um, that the browser vendors have uh, had a mechanism to protect against this. Okay, and so this is called key pinning, and the idea is um, that when I go to like Google's website. I know ahead of time which certificates or which intermediary, you know, certificate authorities will have issued the certificate that's going to be used for the website. So, in other words, you know, Google goes and buys their legitimate certificate. Okay, they know that they're going to be using that for SSL, for example. And what they can do then is, as you go to their website, they can issue this header back to the browser saying, "Hey." You know what? If you're ever coming back to Google, this is the this is the you know the hash of the certificate that I'm going to be using. And so in the future, if you ever come back to Google, you better tr you know don't trust any certificate other than the ones in the list that I've given you. And so what happens then is then if, if your browser is taught, then this is the certificate to trust. And then you start going through infrastructure that has this man in the middle attack where somebody's using a, a spoofed certificate. It'll be a, you know a certificate that doesn't match this list. And so your client connection will say, whoa, something's funny here. You know, don't trust the certificate. Okay? So key pending is basically this mechanism. It still has a bootstrapping process, just like uh, the HSTS I talked about a second ago, where you have to go first, you know, once to the website, 
presumably in a secure network, hit the website, the website tells you, hey, these are the certificates we're going to be using from now on. Only ever trust these. Then when you travel to perhaps a less trusted network, then you will have uh, taught your browser the right certificates to trust. Okay? Um, so anyway, that's a way to, to help mitigate against uh, a scenario where somebody has control of the actual DNS system and uh, the networking infrastructure. So what do you do? Do you end up somewhere where the certificate is not the one you're expecting? Your then you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know who's intercepting your traffic. So, so if you don't mind someone intercepting your traffic, then you can continue. Sure. Right? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really it. Yeah, so stop. You stop using the network. What, what if the original certificate was uh, uh, revoked? Or yeah, and you're absolutely right. The, so if the original certificate is compromised or revoked, then you're screwed. Yeah, absolutely. So people use this with, with definitely a, a tremendous amount of caution. You know, obviously you have an age in here, so you can say maybe maybe short intervals, right? something like that. Yeah. So this is still uh, they actually just they just went into RFC like about a month ago on this on this particular uh, feature. Um, but yeah, I mean those are some of the things you need to be aware of. Um, and so <laughs> if you're going to say pin this particular certificate, you better have really good you know. Security around managing that certificate. Oh. In, in ter terms of the uh, recent attack, where um, I think it was Amazon or someone was getting DDoS attacked because some of the uh, network traffic was being uh, rerouted. Uh, okay. One of these big Chinese sites was a JavaScript file. They were sending a lot of traffic to one of the sites and it brought it down. Uh, what's to say that the uh, exact same network that's giving out dodgy certificates is not going to change the header? Can you specify the dodgy certificate in there? Uh, you mean in here? Yeah. So that's why I said there, this, there is a bootstrapping problem. <coughs> and the bootstrapping problem is that to know the certificate to trust, you have to first go there. So it's not really. Uh, and you have to go over SSL to go the, to get there, right? This, the, the browser won't trust this if the response is not over SSL. Right. So that's why I said is that to, to bootstrap the, the, the trust, you should be doing this from a, a the very first time you go to that website to learn those those certificate hashes. Do it from a trusted environment, trusted network. Well, that means what probably because you, the initial uh, uh, request could also be compromised. Then. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, no, there's absolutely right to be trapping problem, but it's better than nothing, right? And this is exactly how they detected the attack in whatever the country was that I can't remember the name of. Um, and so they detected this because what happens is when a browser starts seeing certificates that don't match this, they actually send reports back to Google, right? And this is actually how this was uncovered, um, that all of a sudden a lot of people were seeing, you know, fraudulent certificates from Google that didn't match what Google said you should be expecting, okay? So again, you know, it's better than nothing, but you're right, there's a bootstrapping problem, okay, absolutely. Okay, so that's kind of it for the for the SSL portion here. Uh, we're gonna move into injection attacks. So um, you guys have all heard of SQL injection. I have trust, right? Most people have, yeah. So basically, the idea of this is that um, the the SQL injection is just one example of all the you know all the injection attacks. So basically, the premise is that the uh, attacker, the end user, is somehow passing a value into you, and then you're taking that value and merging it somewhere else within your application and the, the place you're merging it into or using the value basically gets evaluated as an executable statement in some way. Okay? So SQL is one example of that where maybe someone's passing you in their name into some MVC action method and then you take that name and you are concatenating it into a SQL statement and then you run that SQL statement. And of course what the attacker is going to do is they're going to put in SQL statements for that name value therefore altering the SQL statement you're executing. And you're really giving them, you know, a carte blanche to go and just run SQL uh, in your database by doing that, okay? So the fundamental premise here is that input is evil, right? Input is dangerous to trust. So you can't trust this thing, and so you need to somehow protect yourself against it. Now the protections depend on the context. So with SQL, there are a few things you can do about this. Uh, one is that you use encoding, right? So if you use parameterized SQL, then when you execute those back down to your database, 
they get encoded uh, and interpreted as values, not as source code or SQL statements, you know, uh, in the raw. So parameterization uh, is one way to deal with this. Uh, obviously, if we're using the more modern frameworks like Entity Framework, uh, then that will uh, parameterize automatically uh, for us. But if you're still doing any of the old, you know, ADO style, or I don't know if you're doing PHP coding or whatever, I don't. Uh, I think they have parameterization in that environment, but um, I don't know if they're, they're EF equivalents. But um, you know, it's the same issue in, in all these different environments. Okay. And so what you want to do is parameterize your SQL to hit your database, and that's probably the easiest thing you can do to help protect against this. <laughs> Uh, validation of inputs is also a really good thing to consider. Uh, validating these inputs to, for values that uh, you know to be good values, right? You check. Uh, regex is, is uh, helpful here, uh, except there are actually uh, attacks against regexes. Um, there, uh, if the attacker knows that you're using a regex to validate the value before you, you know, pass it along, um, there are certain regexes that they can craft because a regex is code. And so what they will do is they will craft a regex that basically runs for an infinite amount of, uh, uh, you know, a, a really long execution, uh, in, in essence, you know, a denial of servicing your, your server. Um, so um, I, don't, uh, I don't know if the regex uh, APIs, um, I think they do, they support timeouts. So you could actually even put a timeout uh, on your regex as well to say if it runs longer than five seconds, something's bad. Right, and fail. But just keep in mind that regexes as well also suffer from this potential uh, injection attack. Uh, Rob, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm not something I'm missing, but if your SQL statement is formed with a, with a quote, can you not simply pass the presence of the quote and um, fail the request before you get the SQL statement? So, so your, your validation check on the parameter is you're going to look for a quote? Oh, the, the, you're looking for, you're looking for the, the... So you're building an SQL statement. You're saying select blah 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 um, where name equals patent quotes, and yeah. you're putting in the use of input string and close quotes. Right. So that should be safe, provided that quote single or double isn't present in the string. Um, that, 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 so, that. so maybe for that scenario, that might be safe, <coughs> but uh, that tends to. Um, uh, so there are two types of ways to do validation. One is called black box testing, and one is called white box testing, where um, Black box testing is where you look for the values that today you know are not good, or you know are, are malicious, or will will break your SQL statement in some way. But there might be other values in the future that we discover that you know isn't in your list of invalid values. So there might be something, maybe it's some new feature in the database they add in the next version. Who knows? And then your uh, 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 list of bad values really should get expanded over time, okay? So that's, that's the concern with the, the, what you just described to me, okay? So white box testing is the opposite where what you do is you check for all the things that you know are always good, right? So maybe you check for A to Z, uh, upper and lower, and one through nine. And all those can go through, and everything else you just, you, you block, or, or, you know, you reject. Um, maybe even for the name, one through nine may, or, you know, zero through nine may not even make sense. So maybe you, you, you filter even further. It's a lot of, I, I will admit, it's a lot of work, right? Can I just give an example of uh, Sure, go ahead. Which is like a null byte on, um, a null byte in a file in like Linux operating system is quite harmful. And obviously database, I just start data in a file. Yeah. And if you, uh, oh, like, goodness. fill out uh, strings, for instance, and you allow, uh, like, like a word with a null byte, terminate a null byte, it's going to kill the database anyway, because it's got a null byte. Right. It doesn't matter whether it's got four or not. <laughs> so there you go. That's a perfect example of why the, 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 the fixed list of bad values is perhaps not the best approach. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't, uh, well, specifically ASP uh, MVC have some anti secret injection stuff in it? No. In the values that they come in there? They have anti uh, CSER, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cross uh, scripting checks, but not SQL injection checks. I thought I remembered I bumped into something where we were trying to accept some values from the form. Let me see it. And it and yeah, no. Something kicked in in MVC and stripped out half the stuff. No, you're, you're so I think, you're expecting. Numbers, the great big long number that you get at the bottom of the passport thing we're having to accept. I, I bet it was cross-site scripting 
protection, not SQL injection. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, well, that actually leads us to the next one, which is cross-site scripting attacks. Okay? So cross-site scripting attacks are just another type of injection attack. <coughs> the context, though, is uh, uh, you know, um, your HTML is the source code that the attacker is trying to inject into rather than your SQL statements. Okay? And so the attack here is that you take a parameter, again, kind of like the SQL one, you take some, some parameter from the user, and what you do is you render that into your markup. And you just take the you know the raw value and you just blindly render it out. Maybe that the user is entering a form and they you know they enter their name and you just echo it back to the user um, uh, you know by rendering it into the into the page. Okay. And so again, the problem here is that the attacker can enter in well any HTML then, right? And that will get rendered into the HTML. Okay. So if an attacker in that name field, whatever this is, if they enter some script tag like this. But in essence, they have a way to have your web page render that script tag into the browser. Okay? Now, if they just do this to themselves, right, that's not going to accomplish much. But imagine your product name is a query string parameter. Right? They put the script tag as the value of that query string parameter, and then they send out a spam email to 2 million people. Right? And they just need 5 or 10 people to click that link. And then what happens is when that user opens up the, clicks the link, opens up the browser, it will inject the script into the browser running, you know, into the victim, that target user. And now the bad guy is running JavaScript in that browser, okay? And uh, I guess a smarter bad guy would have done HTTPS here. Um, I guess I'm not I'm a smart bad guy, I guess. Um, <laughs> just looking at that. Um, but uh, um, the bad guy now has JavaScript running in that page. And what if that page is like, okay, now enter your username and password, right? Their JavaScript is running on that page, capturing keystrokes. And now they've captured username and password, or whatever other data is in the page, or they can trigger submits of button clicks and things like that, and it will be done as that end user, okay? So that's a mechanism for doing a, 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 an attack like this, a cross-site scripting attack with script. There's also a really clever one, which is they can do it with a scriptless uh, attack, which is where they input in uh, into the into this name field, they input in something like an image that goes to the bad guy's website, question mark, and then that's all they submit. And so what happens then is when you take this value that you think is the product name, you render it into your page, you're end rendering an image tag that does not properly terminate, and the question mark <coughs> basically then captures the entire rest of the HTML that's in that page and passes it as a query string parameter up to the bad guy's website. So even if like JavaScript's not involved, the attacker has a way to capture everything from that portion of the page and beyond and get it sent up to them, which could be other contents uh, you know, in the web page. Okay? It's kind of clever. Um, yeah, I, I, when I saw that, I was just like, wow. That's, I'm not smart enough to be a bad guy, so anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, so again, how do we protect against this? Well, again, you can um, validate your input um, basically by not, you know, looking uh, or not allowing in these sort of things. So kind of like we said before, the white box uh, and the, the, the black box testing. Um, there is another uh, mitigation as well, which is to HTML and code for all of your output. Okay? So just like we use parameterized SQL to a SQL statement that encodes the value, we do the same thing when we're rendering. Now, again, I imagine most of you here, if you're doing, you know, Microsoft stuff, you're using Razor, you know, MVC, so you end up getting, uh, Razor automatically does uh, HTML encoding, okay? So that already protects you uh, quite a bit. Uh, if you're in the older ASPX stuff, uh, you always had to do this manually with HTML code, uh, and then they, had it, uh, they have actually added uh, uh, syntax in the ASPX syntax, uh, angle percent colon, uh, for doing uh, that encoding as well. Uh, one more thing, I just want to step, step back a slide here. So there are times, though, when you do want to allow um, um, angle brackets and things like that submitted up into your application. So again, uh, by default, ASP.NET already protects against this. When you're reading the query string or the form, they will check for uh, what they perceive to be this uh, cross-site scripting content. And again, the, the gentleman in the back, I think that's probably what, what you probably saw. It was cross-site scripting uh, protection that was built in. 
Uh, you do sometimes have to disable this, which maybe is what, what, what you were thinking of. You, you, you know, it wasn't working, I need to allow this kind of content in. Uh, rich, rich editors is a common scenario of that, right? You want to do rich HTML editing in the browser, well, you're submitting up these angle brackets, which from ASP.NET's perspective looks like, you know, script attacks. Um, so the common approach for, for doing this is um, you can do validate input <coughs> false in MVC. And validate input false um, turns off this uh, validation check in, in ASP.NET. Uh, it does it for the entire request. So that maybe is a little coarse grained. Uh, if instead, though, your action method were actually uh, accepting a model, and you're using model binding with MVC, and only one of the properties was the HTML content, uh, then you can annotate that with uh, allow HTML. It's an attribute that you can put on, on the property. Uh, and just that one property will disable the uh, the HTML, uh, the cross-site scripting uh, check. Oh, am I right in saying that um, application-wide validation is that it will create a YSOD, won't it, if it happens? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? So it will create a YSOD. The yellow screen of death? Yeah. If, if what? I'm sorry, I didn't catch you. If, so if it detects that the, it's, that, uh, the code has come across um, oh, yeah, 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 it craps out. <laughs> yeah, it will completely crap out. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you have to handle that? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that is the case. Um, uh, it, it's an exception. So it's just like any other unhandled exception within your application. So I always used to handle application underscore error in my global ASAX, which was really handling all unhandled exceptions at the ASP.NET level. Not at the MVC level, but at the ASP.NET level. And I would always just render out a, a generic error page at that point. Um, so, I mean, that's just standard sort of error page handling uh, in your web app. At least that's what I would do. Uh, it's very generic, I admit, but, um, you know, it's better than the yellow screen of death. So. Okay, so we talked about that. Okay. So, here's the real, <laughs> or, or a really good solution to all of these sort of injection attacks into the browser. Because there are more. There are actually CSS injection. There's JavaScript injection, right? I mean, there's, there's just a whole bunch of uh, other types of contexts. There's URL injection, like if you're running an, a URL, uh, like a, an href on an anchor tag. So um, a, a really nice uh, idea might be, why don't we prevent inline JavaScript? Okay? Don't allow it. And that actually really uh, is, a, is a novel idea for solving the problem. Because this is where this comes in. You have HTML, you have inputs from the user, and you're intermingling these inputs into your HTML, and that's where these problems occur. So there's a specification called CSP, Content Security Policy, that is implemented by the newer browsers. And what this is is a feature where you can tell the browser, hey, you know what? I'm worried about all this cross-site scripting stuff. So how about you just don't allow JavaScript, inline JavaScript, okay? You can still download a separate JS file. So you can have a script tag, download a JavaScript file, and that will run in the context of your page. But any inline JavaScript, you do not want to run. That also goes for inline styles, right? Uh, and a whole list of other features of the browser uh, that you can trigger from inline uh, stuff, basically, from your HTML. And so this is a really nice feature to help prevent um, these sorts of things. Basically, what you do is you render this header called Content Security Policy. Okay? The minute you have this header in your response, the browser then will shut down all of that execution within inline content in your HTML. And then what you end up doing is then you tell the, um, the, the, the browser what JavaScript that you allow to run, for example, okay? or what CSS you allow to run. And you do so by basically indicating um, host names. Right? of websites that you want to uh, allow your, uh, the, that you trust for your JavaScript. Okay? So what's happening is the browser sees this. It says, okay, shutting down all JavaScript in the browser, except JavaScript loaded from foo.com and whatever domain we're currently on for the web page itself. Okay? And so now all of your, uh, you know, all those attack vectors with cross-site scripting are now really you know, um, very much shut down. Okay? This is a huge help uh, in protecting against that. So you can put uh, self, foo.com, uh, HTTPS, bar.com, startup, baz.com uh, as basically the sources uh, of JavaScript that you trust to run. Okay? But again, those sources all have to be downloaded with a separate script tag. Okay? 
This is also the case for other features within the browser. So um, script source, this is basically how you say what JavaScript to whitelist to allow. Uh, it turns out that like um, um, uh, WebSockets then is also disabled, right? Uh, images, styles, fonts, all this list of other things. But when you have content security policy, these are all shut down in the browser. You're basically saying, I don't want these features from you because I might be attacked by some <coughs> malicious code. And then you whitelist all these things that you know about that you're developing in your app that you want in the page. So you list the, uh, you know, the, the host names of the images that you trust and the CSS that you trust and the uh, domains that you want to use, um, you know, web sockets to go back to, things like that. Okay? So this is quite a, 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 quite a useful thing to uh, help protect you even more than all the other cross-site scripting preventions that, that we talked about. Okay, questions about this? They're actually working on another version of it already. This is, a, this is the older version, but uh, um, they're working on, a, you know, continuously working on these things. What kind of browser support does this have? Uh, I think it's IE, uh, IE 10 is the, and then, you know, all the others. Um, let's go look real quick. Uh, IE 10 and 11, and then all the other recent, you know, Firefox, Chrome builds. Can you use like operators on this one? Can you use what? Like operators, like start all that. Uh, so what you're doing is with the, the directives here, yeah. you're putting basically um, like the host names uh, that you wanted to, uh, to allow. Uh, I don't know if you could, yeah, like right here. So, so start.baz.com, if that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So actually, let's show that. Let's go to uh, Facebook, the most secure site. And I apologize for whatever's about to pop up here. <laughs> it looks like I'm logged in. But what I wanted to show here was, let's refresh one more time. Uh, the home page of Facebook, right? Facebook.com. If I click this, notice what they're putting here in their headers, right? Content security policy. And so uh, this is actually kind of funny. So when you add this, then by default, everything's disabled. And then you can put this default source, which is for all the other things like scripts and images and, and you know, um, Ajax calls and um, web sockets and all those things. Um, here are the ones to trust by default. So they immediately disable everything and then re-enable everything else, which I don't quite get that one. Uh, but then they go and, and whitelist every single thing. So script source, right, you, they trust uh, scripts coming from their own, Facebook.com, uh, Facebook, uh, oh, HTTP Facebook, which is, which is interesting. Uh, looks like some content delivery network, you know, Facebook CDN, uh, Facebook.net, uh, Google Analytics, things like that. Okay. Uh, and then down here, oh, it looks like what they're doing is, is they're only doing it for scripts. Okay. So, oh no, there's Connect. So there's all the Ajax and website <coughs> stuff. I, I'm trying to see, is there images or CSS in here? I can't quite see, but anyway. So it looks like they're saying, yeah, go ahead and let, let everything except for scripting and except for a, uh, Ajax stuff. And then they're whitelisting those, those features. I'll take it under IE9 or earlier browsers that just don't get that security law. Just... Correct. For, for the browsers that don't know what that header means, you don't get that protection. Right. Yeah, another comment? This uh, interest, inter interesting uh, list of things to uh, possibly attack, I think. Absolutely. It's an interesting list of, of things to go after, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but at least that list is pared down, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so. All right. I got a question about that because Facebook also has like inline scripting uh, if you check your source. So how does that work? You, you can enable your own. Um, you can do unsafe inline as well, uh, okay. and that will allow inline scripting. Okay. Which to me feels like it's kind of defeating the point, but that means your server side cross site scripting prevention is really good and you really trust it. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. That's a, a nice feature. Um, if an attacker is able to do a cross site scripting attack, again, they pretty much can do anything the user can do. Uh, right, they're running JavaScript in the page, so they can see any of the data, key, stroke, you know, access, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, oh, a very common thing that they want to go after as well, though, is your cookies, right? Cookies for doing authentication. Uh, and so cookies are programmatically available in JavaScript. Um, and so um, this was one of the very first attacks or, or what people would go after when they introduced a cross-site scripting attack. Uh, so this is a, a feature that they've had for a really long time, which is when you render a cookie, if you want that cookie to be protected against cross-site scripting, um, then you can set a flag called HTTP only on the cookie. And what that tells the browser is that uh, any JavaScript in the page should not be able to read the value of the cookie. Uh, and so the cookie should only be used when sent on the network over HTTP calls. Okay? Uh, it's kind of a funny name. It's almost like, well, I don't know, HTTP only to me sounds like, you know, don't, don't allow it without SSL. It's kind of what that sounds like to me. But what it really means is network only. It should only be sent on the network. Okay? So that's a feature that's been there forever. OK, uh, a couple other uh, attacks here. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we're OK. Uh, so uh, the next type of attack is this thing called a cross-site request forgery attack. And so a cross-site request forgery attack is a scenario where, uh, let's say, my, my mom is uh, you know, uh, in her browser. Uh, she's doing her Gmail in one tab, and then decides to pay some bills on her bank in the other tab. And so she opens up another tab and is there uh, you know, doing banking, whatever that is. Uh, and then she flips back to the other tab, and she gets an email from me that says, hey, mom, uh, this is a really good book. You know, I think you should, you should buy it. Uh, and she clicks it, and it uh, turns out it really wasn't for me. And uh, it takes her to some you know, malicious website that looks like Amazon or something, and she's like, yeah, right, I like that book. I'll, I'll click the button. Okay? And what ends up happening is that button submits to the bank's website. In that web page, there's a form on the malicious site that is posting to the legitimate website. And what is going to happen when that submit goes from the malicious tab, or the, the, the tab that's in for the malicious website, when it goes to the bank's website, okay, that request is going to send everything uh, to the bank's website that you would have been sent if my mom was coming from the regular website of the bank. Namely, the cookies, okay? Because when a browser gets a cookie, right, that's usually what we use for authentication on websites. Um, and you do work and you submit a form or whatever, that cookie gets sent along and that's how the, the server authenticates the caller, okay? Well, the bad guy can do the same thing, right? They can open up another tab, they can submit to some endpoint on the bank's website, and it will be as my mom, as the end user. And the bank needs to be able to know that my mom didn't really mean to do whatever the, the function was that was being invoked on the server, like transfer funds or whatever. Okay? So this is called a cross-site request forgery. A malicious website is taking advantage of the fact that, well, it's a timing attack, right? My mom does have to be logged into the bank's website. But they're taking advantage of the fact that the browser will always send the cookies up to the bank's website, okay, if, if there is one. Okay, so how do we protect against this? Anti-forgery tokens. Yep. So there's this thing called anti-forgery tokens, and this is the bank's responsibility to, to protect against this, uh, or rather, I guess your guys' responsibility as the website developers. Uh, and basically, what you need to do is you need a mechanism for authenticating the HTML that is submitting the form. That's in essence what we're trying to do. We need to authenticate that the HTML came from the bank's website, not the bad guy's website. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, what happens is the typical approach is when the user first logs in to the website, you give them their normal authentication cookie. <coughs> and the other thing at login time, or, or when you, the very first time you need this uh, support, is you'll generate some random value, some big you know, 128-bit randomly generated value, a GUID, something like that would do. And you render this, uh, you generate this, and you render then uh, uh, a new uh, cookie back to the browser that has this value. And then in the bank's website, anytime it builds an HTML page with a form that's going to submit back, you render a hidden input into the form. Okay? And that's going to have some random value, right? And then when the, 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 the user submits the form, up on the server, you compare the cookie's random value number with the form submit's random number. And if they are the same, then you know that that HTML that submitted the form came from the bank's website. Okay? If my mom is on the, the bad guy website, 
right? What, you know, they would have to put a random, uh, uh, the hidden input with the random number in here. And because the value's in a cookie, the malicious website can't read that, okay, unless there's a really fundamental flaw in the browser, okay? Uh, but the malicious website wouldn't be able to read that. Therefore, when they submit, they will be missing this anti-forgery token, and your server should then, you know, reject the call. Okay? So, that's what you need to add. Fortunately, in MVC, this is very easy to do. There's an HTML helper called HTML.AntiForgery token. And you put that inside of every single form uh, in your web application where you are concerned about this cross-site request forgery. Basically, where the user is going to be authenticated and something sensitive may occur. Okay? So that will generate the, the value, the cookie, and put it into the, into the, uh, into the uh, hidden input. And then here on your uh, action method, the one that does the submit, you have this attribute called validate anti forgery token. Uh, and that is a, an authentication filter in MVC that does this check for you. And just like the other stuff, if it fails, it throws an exception and you get the yellow screen to die. Okay? But of course, you're going to have wonderful error handling and you know, show some, you know, sorry, we're having problems, uh, error to the user. And of course, have logged out the fact that that happened. And then your, uh, you know, your ops team can go check out what the IP address submitted that. So, okay. okay anyway, uh, you guys probably should have seen this before in MVC. If you're not using it, you should. Okay. So the the C surf stuff that I just described, um, that works really well, and actually. That works really well for this type of application up here, the one where we are rendering HTML, because it's really easy to bootstrap that, that CSERF you know, value into the HTML, okay? Uh, and then make our call back to our, our endpoint. Um, it doesn't work so well for APIs, okay? And the reason for that is that uh, with web APIs, um, when you're doing your authentication, right, first of all, you're relying upon a, like a cookie for authentication. And if you have clients that are not browsers, using a cookie for authentication is, you know, I don't know, that's just a little odd, right? Uh, HTTP already has a, a designated way for doing this programmatic you know, authentication uh, for every call. That's with the authorization header. Um, and so having a non-browser client app use a cookie to do that is a little funny. And then also you have this sort of bootstrapping problem because you need a mechanism for uh, you know, a client application isn't running an HTML form. It doesn't download an HTML page to get started to then, you know, make calls back. Uh, so this anti-forgery token approach um, is still needed for web APIs, right? You still absolutely need this. Um, but um, really using the cookie approach uh, and this bootstrapping thing is, is a little, little odd. So if you're doing web APIs, um, the, the short answer is, for doing your security checks for your authentication calls, you really shouldn't be using cookies, okay? Instead, you should be using some sort of token-based approach. And what that means is that uh, you still need to get a value and present it on every request to authenticate the call, kind of like with what the cookie does, right? A cookie authenticates every call. But um, the difference is, if you get a token, you are going to be passing that token explicitly from your, let's say you're doing JavaScript, okay, you're going to set this explicitly in every single call, all right? And so um, that means you have to have obtained a, a valid, legitimate, uh, uh, you know, token. Um, the cross-site request forgery really is not a, a, an issue then if you have to pass an explicit value because you can't do JavaScript cross-origin, right, by default, or AJAX calls uh, cross-origin. Um, and of course, then the, 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 other, uh, the other web page had to have obtained that token somehow. So it's a similar kind of concept, but uh, the short of it is that uh, you need to use something else to do those authentication calls. Uh, and so that kind of begs the question, it's like, what do you, what do you, you use? And so there's a protocol for this, uh, which is called OAuth, right? OAuth is the protocol that you should be using uh, for doing security for your web APIs. It involves you getting a token and then sending it on, on every request. Uh, that's actually the open source project that, uh, that I work on. Uh, is um, an open source uh, framework uh, project for obtaining these tokens. Uh, it's called Identity Server. And so just briefly, I just wanted to show you kind of what that might look like. 
So I have some JavaScript here, and the point of this JavaScript is to go get a uh, token, uh, and OAuth is the protocol that it will follow to do that. Uh, and so when you launch the JavaScript client, right, you get sent, so that was one website, you get sent then to this server that knows how to give you these tokens, okay, and you can go log in with some mechanism. Okay. And then what we end up getting back then in the response, in this case the, the, the client is a, a JavaScript uh, type of client application, this token comes back in in, uh, in the URL up here in this hash fragment, and uh, this is called an access token. And this access token is basically a big blob that is in essence kind of the same idea as a cookie, right? And you would send this on every single call instead of a cookie, okay? To do that, it's actually quite simple. Um, once you have obtained that access token, whenever you do your AJAX calls, so I'm using uh, XML HTTP requests just in the raw here. You can easily do this with jQuery or Angular or whatever else. Uh, but the, the, the point is, uh, you set this authorization header and you send it a, a, along, in this case, it's a bearer scheme uh, with one little bit of white space here and you actually pass in the access token along, okay? So that's what I mean by you're explicitly passing the token on every AJAX call back to your server. And that defeats the cross-site request forgery attack because we're not, uh, the browser isn't implicitly sending anything anymore. That's really the, the gist of it. Okay, so anyway, not all hard. Okay, questions about that? Yeah. Um, there was a presentation earlier, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, briefly mentioned all this. Yeah. Um, but one thing I was wondering is, um, like, Say you're doing a uh, request for a web page, and you've got the token. Mm -hmm. um, how are you supposed to uh, pass the token to the client and the uh, web server if you can't set that header in the browser? Like, how can you force the browser to set that authorized header? <clears throat> so, well, what happens is the, the whole point of this OAuth protocol is a mechanism. So, so we're talking <coughs> about a scenario where we have a JavaScript application running in a browser. Uh, just like visit a web page, like a standard request. Okay, so are you talking about, well, so the whole thing with OAuth is that OAuth uh, has uh, different design patterns for the different kind of common use case scenarios. And so that depends on the nature of the application that's being built. And so if the application is JavaScript and it's calling the API directly, like as an AJAX call, um, you, uh, OAuth gives you one way for obtaining the token. Right? And so from JavaScript, it would kind of do what I just showed up here. You get the token back in that URL hash fragment. You programmatically can simply read that, right? And then you set that in the authorization header and make your calls. And the server then has a mechanism for, for validating the, the token uh, and you know who the user is and is trusted. Um, if the call that you're making, though, is from your server-side code, okay, then there's a different uh, uh, approach for obtaining a token. So, I, I, is that your question, or? What I meant was, um, say uh, your website redirects the user to a third party token provider website. Uh, that sets the token, passes it back to your web application. Yep, so your web application now has the token. Yeah, right. But the client doesn't have that token, so how do I pass the uh, token from the client to the web server? Uh, I guess I'm confused because from what you just described, that web application is the client. It is the one using the token. Um, well, say, say um, for instance, like, like the user's logged in, uh, the token's been passed to the web application, but the web application now has a session between <coughs> the user and like, like the spell session ongoing. Yeah. Um, do I set that token in a cookie to then pass back to the... Uh, so, okay, so you're saying then when the token comes back to the web application, and it's server side, yeah. I want to make it available to the JavaScript? Uh, you, want, you want to make it available to the user so there's now a session, so the next time the user visits a web page, they, they don't need to log in again. Uh, I, I, I'm not following your, your question, so have, come up afterwards yeah. and, and we can talk a little bit more about it, okay? All right, so sorry, I didn't follow that. I think uh, when, when the, um, the protocol, once you got, got the token back, yeah. Uh, from the token server, then it's the responsibility of the web application to set a normal cookie for the, the client so that the client stays authenticated against the, the web with, Against the web app itself? Was that yeah. your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, uh, okay, so yeah, I mean, I guess I was just assuming that piece. So, yes, um, 
once you come back from the, 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 the wherever, whatever is issuing the token, okay, and you come back into your application, yeah, you still have to maintain your own logged inness, whatever that means. Does that not cause a weak pipe in the security thing? <coughs> um, well, you're going over SSL, right? You set all the right flags on the cookie. How, how's that any worse than the cookie itself? Well, what if you're not going over SSL? I mean, not every country in the world supports SSL. Well, hold on. So and if you, you take the application on a global scale, and you've got, you got countries that don't support SSL, then it's still insecure because you pass in plain text. Sure, if you're not doing SSL, you're not doing security. You can store it in a local storage in the browser. So yeah, come up afterwards and we can talk more about it. Okay. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally, the premise of all of this stuff that I've been talking about is you're going over SSL. Because mm. if you don't have that, then you don't have server authentication, you don't have confidentiality, you don't have integrity checks. That's the fundamental basis of security. If you can't guarantee those, then there is no security. Okay? If Sorry. You're, if you're getting an, uh, an access token from um, an SPS, yep. uh, is it necessary or probably, is it, a, is it still a good practice, practice to use the uh, HTML validate validated <coughs> token? Do I still need to, to ask those? Uh, uh, so well, those are two different things, right? So the anti-forgery token that I was talking about is useful for submitting back to your own web server, okay? As a form post, right? Form your encoded data. If you are then making AJAX calls back to your endpoints, that's where you use the token. And that is your way to do authentication without having the cross site uh, request forgery uh, issue or vulnerability. Okay? So I mean, that's fundamentally it, right? If you have a browser, you have your web server, and you're doing form posts from a, a HTML form, you can still use the cookie for that. Again, assuming SSL for everything, right? But the minute you start making AJAX calls back to your API or somebody else's API, don't use the cookie anymore for those. Even though it's the same website, it feels natural to want to use the cookie. But you are subject to this cross-site request forgery attack. So either you come up with your own anti-forgery token mechanism, okay, which at the end of the day involves you setting something explicitly on every call. Okay? Or you use OAuth, you obtain a token, and you're setting that explicitly on every single call. Right? That, that's the, the short answer. Okay? Okay, uh, we have two or three more things and then I think we're done. So we're in the home stretch. Okay, I told you this is a big laundry list of just things you have to be aware of. Okay, here's another attack. So imagine you are on Facebook, right? And uh, somebody on Facebook <coughs> posts up on the wall and says, hey, uh, click here for this uh, funny picture of a cat. Okay, of course it's not a cat, but it's a cat, right? So you click the link, you're like, oh, I want to see the cat, right? So it opens up a new tab. Okay, and there's a video there of, you know, it looks like a cat. It's like, you know, you can, you can start the video. Okay, and so what happens is you then click the button for the video, but it, nothing happens. Right, it doesn't start. You know, you click it, click it, nothing, you know, it's not running the video. You're like, this stinks. Okay, so you close the tab and you go back and you, you still have Facebook up and you just see at the top of your own, you know, post stream that you posted the exact same link to the video. Okay. <coughs> But you didn't, right? You went to you went to some look like a YouTube page, but it wasn't really YouTube. It was kind of a weird. I don't know. It, you didn't you didn't ever like that thing in Facebook. So what happened? Okay. So this is something called clickjacking. Okay. Clickjacking, uh, and this <laughs> happened to me. And I, as soon as I was, uh, you know, as soon as I was, you know, done, I was like, oh, I know exactly what they just did. Um, so what happens is when you open up that tab to the malicious website. What they have done on their web page is they have a page that looks like there's a video there ready to play, but they have an iframe on that web page. And they set the iframe uh, on top in terms of the, uh, the Z order, so it's on top of the video. And the iframe then actually points to the Facebook website. And it points to the Facebook website positioned right over the like button for the thing that you, that you just clicked. Okay. And so what happens though is that the, that the iframe is um, transparent, okay? So they set the opacity to be zero, I think that's the right value, right? To make it see-through, okay? And so it's positioned right over the play button. So when you think you're clicking the play button, you're actually hitting the iframe on top of it, hitting the like button over in Facebook. And the reason that that works is because the iframe is open to Facebook you already had a cookie with Facebook, so you were logged in in the main tab, and now in the iframe, you're also logged in. 
And so that's why Facebook <coughs> thought that you went to their page and clicked the like button for the cat video. Okay? Or, or whatever you clicked, right? So, so you too. It happened to you too, right? Okay, I got you. Okay. Uh, I think... Uh, I think Amazon had this issue as well. They had a, they had the same vulnerability for their click one to buy thing, where if you were logged into Amazon, you could click the button on a product page, and it would just immediately add it to your cart, pay for it, done, right? So you wouldn't even have to go through any checkout process. It would just click buy, click buy, click buy. And so there were attackers doing this, where they were you know doing uh, uh, iframes on other websites, and you were clicking things one thing, and you were actually buying things from from Amazon. Okay? Just so I mean, that's another example. Uh, it's not just cat videos. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, how do we protect against this? Okay. Well, the older way to protect against this is you would put this HTML in your web page. In, in essence, <coughs> you had to protect against this. You had to put something in your web page to prevent it from running in an iframe. And so, look what this little snippet is doing style HTML display none. That makes your entire HTML page not visible. Okay. And then what you're doing is you're programmatically in JavaScript doing if top equals self, which is basically detecting if the top level window is your own window, then you are redisplaying your HTML. So in other words, with style sheets in JavaScript, with style sheets we're making everything not visible, so therefore there's nothing to click on, and then programmatically re-enabling it if you are in the top level window. Okay? So this was kind of like the, the first idea on how to solve this problem, and it kind of works except for people who have JavaScript disabled, and the reason that people disable JavaScript is they're trying to be more secure, right? <laughs> so it ends up actually hurting those people. So finally, it's actually the IE team who proposed this, I believe. I think it was like around IE8. In IE8, they proposed uh, an HTTP header that your server could e emit to tell the browser that you don't want to run on an iframe, okay? So it's this header called XFrame Options. You can issue this from your website, and you can say deny. And deny basically means don't ever show this page in an iframe. And you're basically relying upon the browser to protect you from this. Okay? Uh, if you want to run your own pages in iframes, you can do the same origin. So that would relax it so that uh, your pages from the same origin web, you know, website can, can do this with each other. But cross that boundary, they cannot. Or you can be explicit and do this allow from. <coughs> so actually, if we go back to Facebook. Oh, they're doing strict transport security. We talked about that. Okay. And they're doing X frame options tonight. Okay. So, fortunately, Facebook <laughs> is, can't happen to you again, at least if you're running on a modern browser. But even IE, I think it said it was 8 uh, and beyond, uh, protects against that. All right, so anyway, that's a, a good thing to, uh, to put into your applications. All right, questions about that one? Didn't you say that in the previous slide that you ran upon inline styles and inline JavaScript? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So that's that's why was, this is more illustration. Like prior to IE8, that's how we were we were trying to solve it. But again, it wasn't perfect. Um, this is what I use now. So I don't bother with the top one anymore. Yeah. You could do this though, um, even with content security policy though. That would just have to be done in like a separate JS file rather than inline. Okay. Firefox or deprecate in that header, though. Right. So the so content the security policy, the maybe I I I don't know of that news that you're talking about. But content security policy is starting to become the the behemoth to take on all these other things. So that's why I said content security policy. They're already working on the next version of it, and it <coughs> might well. Replace I think this. that's what it's, what we should use is content security policy that one's going to be deprecated. But yeah. yeah, right. But I mean, today, this is what, what is well understood by browsers. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> okay, here are a couple of more issues uh, related to just building web apps. And this has to do with um, basically model binding in MVC uh, or any other framework that uses model binding. So Ruby on Rails has this problem. Uh, Node.js also has this problem. And the fundamental problem is this, is that uh, when somebody submits data up to your website, um, you want to map that onto objects. Okay? And so they may pass in a form with a name and an age and some data, right? And you want to map that to some objects. 
Um, and rather than you manually reading, oh, form name, map it to my object name, and form age, map it to my object age, you want the framework to do that for you. Right? And they'll somehow you know, dynamically look at all the input values that are being submitted and map them to this object model that you have. Okay? So the problem with this, though, is that you may have written your web page to only accept name and age. Okay? But if a bad guy knows that you're mapping this onto a data structure with more properties, then the bad guy can start submitting more data. Right? And so when they submit more data, because we're using this automated framework to map, then your server-side code is now going to start accepting <coughs> submitted data, this additional submitted data that is beyond the data you anticipated, but the framework just does it automatically. Right? And now you have this object that the attacker has, like, in essence, injected more properties than you were you know, anticipating uh, working with. Okay? So this is problematic when the objects that you're mapping this onto typically are like database entities. Right? Microsoft demos that a lot, where, hey, you just drag, you know, entity framework, you get an object, oh, now use that as your model in your MVC page, and now you can submit data in, and it just maps, you know, almost right, right into your database. Okay, well, yeah, that's exactly what it's going to do when the attacker starts submitting more data, okay? Now, it, it depends on exactly the way you are handling this on the server, right? It's not just wide open to everything. It really does depend on how you've written the code, but it is something to be aware of. And so that if you're automatically trusting model binding, just be aware that an attacker, they can submit whatever they want, and if you don't do anything special, everything is potentially popu you know, populatable, is that a word? Could be populated uh, by an attacker submitting this additional data. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to, yes, get the benefit of this automatic mapping, but curtail the available properties that, are, that can be set. Okay? So in uh, MVC, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, on your model binding, one thing you can do is you can use this bind directive. And you can provide the whitelist <coughs> of properties that you're allowing. And you're saying, only model bind this property. OK, that's one way to do it. Um, that's OK, I guess. Um, the, the thing I tend to do is I don't use entity types in my UI layer uh, for model binding. Uh, what I do is I create dedicated classes. And the dedicated class is exactly what I'm, you know, model binding to. Uh, but then, yes, I have to map from there back to my database entities. And I typically write that by hand. Um, maybe some other tools like AutoMapper or something like that uh, can help you out. But at least what you've done is you have prevented uh, you know, uh, an attacker from making the decision about what gets injected in. You're limiting it by, uh, by the contents of the uh, uh, input model, model type that you create. Okay. So that's called overposting or underposting. So either posting too much or too little. Uh, I think second to last issue here then is the concept of cookieless session or cookieless authentication. You guys ever remember this feature in uh, forms authentication or in ASP.NET session state? They had this feature where uh, you know for cookie, if you're doing session state, you have to track the user somehow. So typically that's done with a cookie uh, or forms authentication again, cookie, right? But if your users have cookies disabled, then you can't do that, okay? Well, um, I guess Microsoft thought it was a good idea to come up with this feature where you can do cookie-less uh, you know, tracking of the user, session state or, or authentication, okay? And what would happen is they'd put the identifier instead of in a cookie, they would put it into the URL like this. And I'm sure you guys have seen websites that look like that, okay? So what's wrong with this? Yeah, absolutely. So the bad guy, what they do is they go to this website, okay? They get a session assigned to them, okay? And they take that, that URL and they copy and they paste it into their spam email, right? My mom again, right? They send her that email. Hey, I think you'd really like this book. So she clicks the link. She's like, you're right. I would like that book. Adds it to her cart, puts in her credit card information, puts in her shipping information, and hits submit, okay? And then about 20 minutes later, the bad guy, you know what they do? they still have that same ID because they are the ones who kind of initiated that session. So by sending it to my mom, she actually jumped onto that session that the bad guy had. So the bad guy can come in after the fact and look at whatever, you know, whatever the website allows you to see from that presumably trusted session. Okay? So really, really bad idea. Um, you know, uh, 
well, first of all, session state is a really bad idea. But anyway, right? Don't use session state, but uh, definitely <coughs> don't want to use uh, use this feature. Okay. We're using this for, for the last 10 years, and we've had a lot of problems. Really? Any good horror stories? One, yeah, one user sent link, uh, his own link to another user. Another user just went to the same session and changed password oh. to the first user. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Right? OK, yeah. Far too easy to copy and paste there. Uh, oh, this relates to passwords, actually. So here's another uh, just a threat you need to be aware of in your apps, right? If you are building uh, login forms, right? Those login forms where the username and password are submitted into you, um, you know that's great. Username, password get logged into the app. Except if an attacker then starts using that and builds an automated tool to start guessing passwords. Okay. So on your login forms, do you have anything that like detects this? Well, you should, <laughs> because it's basically free reign for an attacker. If they know some username, then they can just sit there all day long writing a tool and just let it run and just spam your website uh, trying to guess, you know, trying to guess passwords. Okay, so you need some sort of mitigation uh, on the login form for trying to protect against this. Okay, strong passwords are going to help because it makes the, the attack time, you know, take make the attacker uh, take a lot more uh, long to to, to guess. Um, Two-factor auth helps tremendously as well on this. I think actually GitHub, didn't GitHub have an issue like this? About a year or two ago, GitHub had all of a sudden a, a massive uh, password guessing attack against it. Uh, they didn't run, they were actually more clever. Instead of just sitting there running forever trying to guess one account, they had a distributed version of this where um, they were guessing you know, five times for lots of different users uh, in a distributed uh, sort of uh, way. Um, but anyway, something like that, um, you know, is tricky to uh, tricky to protect against, um, and relying upon something else in addition to just the password is a really big help against these sort of attacks. So two-factor auth. Just block users like Windows does after a certain number of invalid games. Yeah, that would be another way to do it as well. So that's the other thing, right? You could always do a delay, something like that. Of course, that kind of slows down your website. Or yeah, you have to record in your database. They've tried to guess ten times in the last five minutes, right? Whatever threshold you deem as suspicious, right? You can uh, implement that. Uh, so fortunately, uh, I complained a lot to Microsoft that they didn't have this support, and so they added it um, in ASP.NET Identity 2, which is in the last year or so. Um, so finally, in the last year of me, you know, moaning about this <laughs> forever, um, they uh, they added this feature, which is quite nice. So uh, unfortunately, in their implementation, they um, uh, so here's what you have to do, right? You have to do find user by name. You have to do the work, though, of you know checking, unfortunately. So, but it's okay. A few more lines of code in your login screen. In ASP.NET 5, uh, Microsoft have done all that for you in the uh, default scaffold that they're going to release, but you just need to enable it. It's like a boolean, you can change the false to true. So. I've not looked at those templates yet. So not yet, but not yet, but uh, they have been worked on so So they're in the user manager, or they're in the templates? In the uh, startup class. Yeah, okay, I'd have to take a look at it to see how they're doing it. Um, that's actually been my, my so I'm, I'm never happy. Uh, that's my complaint was that they added this feature, but then they made you <coughs> still check it. Yeah. And I would much prefer if that was actually buried in here, in the check password you know, feature somehow. But maybe, maybe they change it in version 3. I actually have not looked yet at the details of, of ASP <coughs> identity version 3. Isn't that an easy way to lock other people's accounts? Oh, great, great point. Yeah, that's a great denial of service attack. Yep. So if I know your username, I'll just guess 10 times, right? And now, haha, -ha, you're locked out of your account, and, you know, good luck getting in. So, sure. Uh, that's why you unlock it after a certain amount of time. Uh, you don't want to involve an administrator. So, that was actually, uh, uh, I think that's what the original membership provider had this feature as well. But they didn't automatically unlock the account. So you had to go find an admin and convince them, hey, I'm really here. Please let me back in. So anyway, yeah, got to be more clever. These, these are actually really hard problems to solve. So there is no easy solution. But you know, um, it's important to think about these attacks and think about how you want to, to manage that. And maybe this is not the right solution for, for everyone. OK, this is the last one. <laughs> so bots. You guys ever seen these before, these capture things? Right, yeah, right. Are they any good? No. No, I should take the slide out, right? Yeah, they're no good. So the idea with these is that um, 
you want to prevent spam on your, you know, your blog website or whatever. And so the idea is before you let a user come through, you have to somehow prove that they're a human and not some automated tool. And so you have to solve the puzzle, whatever. Uh, the problem with these is that there's no penalty for failure. So somebody writing an automated tool, they can just automate the guessing against the, the little puzzle. And if it fails, well, guess what? They let you try again, and they let you try again, and they let you try again. So these would work better, I think, if um, there was some sort of penalty for failing. Like, hey, you can't do this for five more minutes or 10 minutes. Kind of like the password lockout thing. Um, but still, these don't work so well anyway. It does, um, it does help if, if it's a, uh, a feedback form. So it won't send feedback to your website, I think. They get to capture. Yeah, but I mean, if, if somebody's dedicated enough to, to want to spam the feedback form that you're talking about, right, they can write you know, enough code in here to, to basically bypass these. It was actually really easy to bypass them at one point because Google had an issue with recapture where somebody was using an automated voice uh, recognition service okay. to uh, bypass the recapture <laughs> just by uh, guessing what the Yeah, exactly. They're, they're and it, it's been on for about three months, and my, my website got hammered all over because of it, because there's no way of stopping people right. registering, because it depended on recapture, right. and it was compromised. So. Right. And the other thing I've heard is that the, um, the friction rate of users is so high. People hate these things, yeah. right? So you, you, you turn away a huge percentage of people if they have to go through one of these. So. I, I actually implemented my own day. Okay. It was very simple, but because there's nothing written to target. It. Right. So if you if you fly under the radar, right, and, and you're not a big enough target, then sure. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, from that perspective, you know, it's an effort thing, right? If you're using an off-the-shelf one, then they figure out how to crack that one and, and yeah. Uh, the best attack against these that I ever saw was, um, what happened was, like, it was like the Gmail sign-in form. They have one of these, right? And so what was happening is the bad guy here, he wanted to do the automated uh, uh, Gmail uh, form, right? Because they make you do a CAPTCHA to create a new Gmail account. So Gmail was showing back the CAPTCHA, right? C-A-P-T-C-H-A, I believe. And so what the bad guy was doing is, um, they actually set up a porn website, okay? And so what they were doing is they were taking the CAPTCHA and sending it to the porn website, so some guy here wants to go look at porn, right? What they do is they show him the CAPTCHA from Google, okay? And of course, he's going to fill it in correct all of the time. <laughs> and so then he ends up submitting it back to them, which they then submit it to Google. Bingo, they got themselves a Gmail account. And what about this guy over here? No porn. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, that was uh, that was the best that was the best attack I ever heard about on CAPTCHA. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't use them. So, okay. So what's what's the? You know, actually, what the real solution is is you have to have heuristics. You have to have some sort of uh, uh, you know analysis of the posts that submits to your website and do some sort of. Uh, um, you know, uh, analysis on it and make a, an educated guess. I mean, that's how Gmail deals with spam, right? Same kind of idea. Uh, WordPress does that for comments on WordPress as well. And um, they do a really good job of it, actually, right? Uh, I actually have really good results with that. So, so you just uh, that. But, but then for your own applications, you need to incorporate something like that, which probably costs money. Uh, I did actually implement a solution which I came up with myself, yep. which was um, to generate a random URL that lasted a certain amount of time to allow people to register okay. on the site. And uh, bots just seemed to get really confused over that. And by generating a random URL to register, uh, the only problem was if people went directly to the registration page, it wasn't right. there. Right. But genuine people come to the site to register with click. Right. And they get to a randomly generated uh, URL to register. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, that's the thing. You want to confuse the, the automated tools. It, it uh, really if you're a low enough, so, you know, small enough target, they're not going to spend the effort, right, to, to try to uh, attack that. If you're a big enough target or if you use some other, uh, you know, commonly used one, then they will have cracked that one probably. Yeah. So, no, that's, that's a good idea. So, you, gentlemen, uh, sir, down here, you can hire him in the back to help. <laughs> um, so, you guys can meet afterwards. And, so. Okay. So, oops, I'm still writing here. So, anyway, that's basically all I had. Hopefully, you guys... Um, you know, got some insights into some, some uh, nice tools that you can use for building your websites. 
to help mitigate against some of these common attacks. Unfortunately, you have to, like every developer, not just the security developer, like every developer has to kind of know about these things and know to include these protection mechanisms in your site. So anyway, hopefully uh, you guys can take the slides and uh, to start add, adding some notes into your websites. Absolutely, and yes, and it's these are like these are the most common issues I see when I go into consulting, helping people that don't even know about these things. And like content security policy is a huge help, right, for very little effort, right? These little things like that. So, is there any kind of like static file uh, reader that you can use to flag this stuff and fail it before it gets checked in? Oh, oh, so you wanted to have something that will check for your website uh, for all your developers and your organization that, that like flag them if they introduce one of these things? Yeah. <clears throat> no, I mean, I don't know of anything like that off the top of my head. Um, obviously, that could be part of your unit test suite, right? Part of your automated unit testing, right? Which hopefully you have. Uh, and not, not just unit testing, but like end-to-end -end testing. Um, you know, if you're doing like Owen and Katana style applications or ASP.NET 5 applications, loading up your web server in memory, not, you know, not setting it up, and loading up in memory and testing it is actually really, really easy to do. So you could write automated tests that, um, you know, load up your server just in, in an in-memory configuration and test it for the this, this simple stuff. There is actually a company you can pay. Uh, I can't remember the name of them, but when I used to work for the council, we used to do exactly this. Yeah. We used to send our whole code base to them, and they pick up all sorts. And you know, even with us checking for these security issues, they pick up stuff that we've missed. Right. And uh, so there's third-party companies out there. Yeah. That actually, uh, they've got people who go right through your source code and pick out all sorts. Yeah, absolutely. There are penetration testing companies out there. I, I um, sure, you're absolutely right, and they do a great job because they are the bad guy mindset, right? They know how to look for this. Well, they're probably bad guys at one point anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of a cheaper option, I didn't didn't know of anything because it's expensive to have those guys do yeah, that. It's but but it's it's if they find it, it's worth it. It's time as well. Sure, absolutely. You know. Yeah. So more of an automated so approach. Statically reading. Code, yeah, like common stuff that you know, you know yeah. seeing or should be. There are tools that, as well. So the, the pen testers, they just say basically they they have tooling that they use, and so perhaps you could buy the tooling yourself and, and learn to use it. And, and uh, I imagine it's more than a week or two of them coming in. But if you were going to do it over and over and over, it might be worth it for you to get a little bit of expertise uh, yourselves to do that. Question, comment. Uh, there's a tool called HP Fortifier that does stuff like program analysis, which then you can do that security. It has rules for security, uh, so that's what we use. Uh, HP Fortify? And does it do uh, code analysis for like .NET code? Or are you yeah, yeah, yeah. Code. Okay. So we, we use that for our code passwords, but <laughs> okay. it, it has other. Sure. We, we can use other rules. So that's okay. So this gentleman back there vouches for that. HP Fortify. Uh, again, HP Fortify. Okay, yes, there you go. Thank you. Okay, anything else? All right, well, thank you.